Welcome to Madison City Channel's Know Your Candidate Interviews, co-sponsored by the League of Women Voters of Dane County. I'm your interviewer, Shell Gross, and I would like to introduce Lisa Subek, running for the State Assembly in District 78. As we begin, please tell our viewers what educational, occupational, and civic experiences you have that qualify you for this office including your experience working with diverse communities. Thank you, Shell, and thank you for having me. Um, as your viewers may know, I've been in the State Assembly now for eight years. I currently serve as the Democratic Caucus Chair, as well as working for my own constituents. I um, began my career actually in early childhood education, never really envisioned a career in politics. I started teaching for Head Start and was working with low-income children and families, made my way into a career, really focused more on the social services, generally both on early childhood education, but also working with individuals and families who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. And it was really through that work that I was inspired to get involved in politics. I saw systems that were broken. I saw opportunities that the families I was working with didn't have. And I could help one family at a time navigate broken systems. And at the end of the day, the system was still broken. So I really moved into a policy advocacy role. I worked as the director of NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin, fighting for reproductive rights, also worked um, for United Wisconsin, largely on good government issues. I served on the Madison City Council for four years prior to being elected to the legislature. And as I said at the beginning, I've been serving in the legislature for almost eight years now, am the chair of the Democratic Caucus, and want to continue the work that I'm doing for my constituents. Thank you. What specific changes would you support to ensure voters are able to cast their ballots and have confidence in the outcomes of our elections? And what experiences have you had with election administration that inform your response? Good question, Shell. Um, first off, I, as somebody who has run for office and, and am intimately familiar with it from the end of being a candidate. And I've seen firsthand how broken our campaign finance system is. And I've worked to get big money out of politics. I'm actually the lead author of a resolution that would put a referendum on the ballot that would allow the people to be heard on whether or not we should overturn Citizens United. And quite frankly, I already know the answer to that question. We need to overturn that decision. Corporations are not people, and we shouldn't allow massive amounts of corporate cash in our elections. I think people have a lot more confidence in our elections when they know who is um, paying to influence their vote. But I think it goes beyond that. I've been a poll worker and I serve on the campaigns and elections committee in the legislature. I've had a front row seat to the damage that is being done by former President Trump and by Republicans who wanna shake our confidence in our election system. And I wanna continue working to make that stronger to ensure that every vote and every voice is do you think Wisconsinites have adequate access to affordable health care services, including reproductive health and abortion care? What is the legislature's role? You know, every individual should have access to health care. It should be a basic fundamental human right. Um, as such, I do support universal health care, but in the meantime, I do support at the state level expanding Medicaid. Republicans in the legislature have absolutely refused to take federal government money that is available to us. Those are our tax dollars that we're paying to the federal government. And Republicans are refusing to bring them back to our state. States across the nation, in fact, there was just a Jeopardy question on it the other night where they asked about something that most states have done to expand access to health care, and that was to expand Medicaid. Wisconsin is in, a, is in a minority of the states. Red states, blue states, and purple states alike have all expanded Medicaid and, and Wisconsin's been sitting on the sidelines. That is one of the first things that we could do to expand access to affordable health care and to improve the quality of our health care system. As I mentioned in our opening, um, I did work as a director at NARAL Pro-Choice Wisconsin in the legislature. I'm the ranking Democrat on the health committee. And I also am the author of a bill that would overturn Wisconsin's criminal abortion ban. I've been working to do that through my entire time in the legislature. 
unfortunately, there was a time where no matter how many times I said it, people did not think it was what needed to be done. It felt safe. It felt like Roe can never be overturned. And here we are sitting here today, knowing that just last week, the Supreme Court ruled in the Dobbs case to overturn Roe. Now we need to do everything we can to ensure that folks across Wisconsin have the resources they need to get where they need to go to it to access safe and legal abortion. And we need to continue to work to overturn Wisconsin's criminal abortion ban. Abortions are health care, not criminal activity. It really is about our basic freedom to make decisions that impact our own health, our own lives, and when and if we have children. What do you think is required to improve outcomes for students in public schools, including those with disabilities? As a legislator, what would you do to advance those measures? During my time in the legislature, one of the things that has frustrated me most is seeing how we underfund our public schools. I know that the key to strong communities is our strong schools. It's the first thing people look for when they move to a state or a community. The key to a strong, to strong economy is having strong schools and the key to strong families is having strong schools. Every kid deserves a great public education from the time of early childhood through the time they graduate college and beyond. Um, and that is our responsibility. We have we have watched um, as Republicans have cut funding to our public schools, sometimes directly and sometimes through expansions to the unaccountable private school voucher program. One of the first things that I would do is I would stop the expansion of vouchers. Um, no more new vouchers. So that we stop draining money from our neighborhood schools and start putting the money back where it belongs. We then need to get up to that two thirds funding that the state has long promised, but long failed to achieve. And even more importantly, I think we need to really look at how we invest in special education. Children with disabilities um, have the right to the same great education that all children get, but it does cost more and it does present different challenges. And even as we've underfunded schools, but have increased that funding, we have further undercut funding for kids with disabilities that has not kept pace with how we fund our schools. What specific strategies do you support for ensuring clean water for all Wisconsinites? You know, right, right now, one thing that we could do that would help improve our water quality immediately is to set stronger standards for PFAS and other chemicals that go into our water. And we have seen PFAS as a problem statewide, whether you're talking about Door County areas up north, whether you're talking about the area around La Crosse or right here in Madison, we have wells that are contaminated with PFAS. We also need to work together with our farmers in rural areas to ensure that we manage runoff in a way that does not cause further harm to our water. And we need to hold polluters accountable. I think something that I've seen is incredibly um, eye-opening in the legislature is the power that groups like Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce have. And when we are setting water quality standards, you know, I, I believe across the state, no matter where you live, no matter what political philosophy you subscribe to, you want clean drinking water. It is universal and it's a need. And again, similar to healthcare should be human right. We, have, we should all have the right to clean water. Um, but we need to set the standards and we need to hold the polluters accountable. Unfortunately, groups like Wisconsin Manufacturers and Commerce, who are truly the big business lobby in the state, have stood in the way time and again of implementing and enforcing those standards. But we're not giving up. We are going to keep working at it and ensure that everybody has access to clean drinking. What legislation would you support to see that guns no longer get into the hands of those who would do harm with them? It has been so sad to see the um, huge number of incidents of mass gun violence in our country and see the amount of gun violence we see here in our state. I am a strong supporter of expanding background checks, closing the background check loophole so that no matter who you buy your gun from, whether it's a federally licensed dealer or whether it's somebody selling it to, you know, neighbor to neighbor sale, that a background check is done to ensure that that gun doesn't get in the hands of someone who shouldn't own it. I support extreme risk protection orders to ensure that when somebody is in crisis, 
um, we can get guns out of their hands. And I've been the lead author on a package of legislation for safe storage of firearms to ensure that firearms don't get in the hands of children and don't get in the hands of those who, who present a danger to themselves or others. Um, and also to ensure the firearms are stored safely when they are in gun shops and the gun shops are closed. One of the bills where I've been able to get some bipartisan support, although we don't yet have it passed, is a bill that would require that gun shop owners lock up their guns after hours, because so often those guns that up, end up on the streets are stolen from licensed firearm dealers or from other, other um, so-called responsible gun owners who unfortunately um, you know, made an error in judgment or perhaps weren't responsible for that one moment in time and their gun was stolen and it ended up in the hands of somebody who used it to do harm. Finally, I would add that I've worked together with some of my Republican colleagues, particularly Senator, Senator Dale Cuyanga, who authored with me a bill that would get guns out of the hands of um, individuals who are convicted of misdemeanor domestic violence. At the federal level, this is prohibited, but there are some loopholes there that we need to close to ensure that nobody who has been convicted of an act of domestic violence has a gun. We know that if an individual is in a violent situation, they are five times more likely to end up dead if there's a gun in that home. What opportunities do you see to work across the aisle on issues important to your constituents? When I think about working across the aisle and working with my Republican colleagues, I think there are some big issues where we just don't agree. But there is a lot where we have common ground. I think we saw this as we legislated through COVID and found ways to um, implement vaccines and to get them you know, out to people in a fast and efficient manner as we expanded who can give vaccines. One of the bills that I'm most proud of that I've gotten passed was a Holocaust education bill this session that requires the public schools um, provide education about the Holocaust and other genocides to kids um, in middle school and in high school. And, you know, those are bipartisan bills. I've done some work around issues of um, helping individuals with disabilities, issues around foster care and adoption, where I've been able to work really closely with my Republican colleagues, co-author bills together, and lead efforts together to get those passed. Um, as much as I am committed to fighting on those big issues, um, whether we're talking about abortion, whether we're talking about gun violence, fighting to do what's right and to win on those issues, I also see the opportunity to find common ground, to find those areas where we do have something in common and build. And what would you like to say to the beauty, viewing audience as we complete this interview, including any priorities that have not yet been identified? Sure, well, first off, thank you, Shell, for having me here today. Thank you to the League of Women Voters and the City Channel for um, making this happen. I certainly appreciate that opportunity. And I wanna thank the voters of the 78th Assembly District. Um, it is just an honor and a pleasure to serve as your representative. I work really hard to provide, you know, accountable, responsible, um, to make myself responsive, pardon me, and to make myself accessible to you. Um, I believe it's really important that I hear your voice and that while I know I don't agree with every one of my constituents on every issue, that I listen to what you have to say and that my represent representation is responsive to you. So please do um, stay in touch with me. Please make sure that you um, are letting your opinions be known. I represent you better when I know where you stand. And of course, I ask for your vote in November. Um, I, do have a, I do have a Republican opponent. This time I do not have a primary challenge. So um, I don't have an opponent in August, but I, I do have opposition in November. And I ask for your vote when you go to the polls in November. Thank you. I want to thank uh, Lisa for speaking with us today and the viewing audience for taking the time to know your candidates. I want to remind everyone that election day for those candidates involved in the primary is Tuesday, August 9th, and that the fall election is on Tuesday, November 8th. As with every election, please vote. On behalf of Madison City Channel and the League of Women Voters of Dane County, thank you for joining us.